And here's God's word to all of us. God is not looking for people who put in an appearance. God is looking for people who have a heart after Him. God is not looking for spectators. He's looking for participants who go all in with all their heart, devoted to Him to pursue His presence and passion. We don't know why the 22,000 showed up. Maybe they were looking for some free meals and a parade of honor. We don't know if they felt ashamed to stay home when their neighbors were going. But no matter what, they appeared, but their heart was not in it. And today God says, don't just put in an appearance, for appearances are deceiving. Unfortunately, we live in a world today that centers around appearance. This is the danger of social media. It's great and can be used for the gospel, but too much on social media is an illusion and a mirage. In June 2018, the world gathered in Russia for the 21st FIFA World Cup. 32 nations from all over the globe were there to compete. Fans were watching from around the world, and the athletes and coaches had prepared and were ready for their skills to be tested. Among them was the Croatian player Nikola Kolinic. Kolinic was a striker for the Italian club Milan, and he was making his third appearance for his Croatian national team. Yet in spite of his skill and experience, for some reason, in their opening match against Nigeria, the coach didn't play Kalinic. We don't know why, but for some reason, he left him on the bench for the first 85 minutes of the opening match. Then in the 85th fifth minute, with five minutes to go, and Croatia had 2-0, the coach called Kalinic to enter. We don't know exactly why, but Colin each refused. I remember watching the match on TV thinking, this guy's angry, what's wrong with him? Maybe he felt insulted that the coach had benched him for the first 85 minutes. Maybe he thought his skill and experience should be displayed to the world. Maybe he just didn't want to play, but for re whatever reason, he refused to, to join the match. So the coach turned to another player, but then things got worse. After the match, Kalinic refused to apologize. The other coaches begged him, but he stood firm. So the head coach sacked him from the team and sent him from Russia. Kalinic flew to enjoy some private holidays. He took pictures of himself enjoying on his holiday while the rest of the team continued their World Cup run. Maybe Kalinic thought, they're not going to win. They're not going to go far. But surprisingly, the Croatian national team kept winning. They won their group. Then they won their next match and their next, and they ended up in the World Cup final. They accomplished their greatest football achievement in history, reaching the World Cup final for the first time ever. Well, as you can imagine, the 22 players on the team were national heroes in Croatia. Their names were emblazoned on the hearts of a grateful generation. But it was too late for Kalinic. The foolishness of his anger and pride were revealed to the world. If he'd been willing to do whatever was needed, if he'd been willing to pay any price, he too would be a national hero. Instead, his name is synonymous with disgrace. Tell your neighbor, don't be a Kalinich. We don't know for sure, but it seems he made an assumption that the coach was biased against him, so he refused to follow instructions. He made an appearance at the match, but his heart was not in it. He wasn't passionate for his team, so he wouldn't play. And he allowed his appetite to distract him and turn him off course. Rather than humble himself and develop good character, he responded by leaving the team and going to party. And there's a powerful lesson for all of us in the true story of Nikola Kalinic from Croatia. Often we're pursuing our destiny, but we get off track because we do not understand the implications of our decisions. We make assumptions about what will bring success. We think we know the right way, and so we do our own thing rather than listening to God. We put it in appearance, uh, but we don't have a passion to pursue God's presence and purposes. And we allow our appetites to distract us from our destiny. In short, 
we fail to achieve what God has for us because we fail to pass the test. So today, let's discover the tests we all face and how we can pass them so we can get our turnaround in the second half of 2024. <laughs> Almighty and everlasting Father, we come before you today in humility, in the name of Jesus, to ask you to search our hearts and open our eyes and give us the understanding of the test you take all of us through in order to get us to our destiny. Help us to embrace your truth today and open our eyes to see the steps we can take today to pass the test. We submit to you, we bind every voice of the devil that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to enlighten our hearts and minds, the power to give us grace to obey you, the power for a turnaround. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. I want you to join your faith with mine today. Put your hand on your chest and pray out loud after me, Lord Jesus. Speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Welcome to Agape House. It's great to be in July, amen. But not only that, it's great to be in the second half of the year. We're on a countdown to 2025. And no matter what happened in the first half of the year, I believe there is a turnaround in your life. Whatever has happened, God is gonna overcome it. No matter what, he's gonna turn it around and the second half will be better than the first half. If you believe it, say amen. But in order to experience a turnaround, you have to first pass the test. You see, God's grace and God's glory and God's destiny for you is so great that he needs to strengthen you and increase your capacity so that you can carry the weight of the glory that God has for you. So he refines us and purifies us and puts us through tests because that selection process is something we all must undergo. Now, to help us discover the tests and how to pass them, we're continuing our look at the Old Testament hero, Gideon. We began looking at his story two weeks ago with the sermon, When God Sees Me. We found Gideon, Gideon hiding from the enemy, but God gave him a vision of how God saw his own life. God gave him a vision of God. God gave him a vision of his destiny, and suddenly he, things were turned around. He saw himself, he saw God, he saw his destiny, and his turnaround began. Then last week, we had the sermon, Tear Down the Altars. When Gideon got activated by his vision, he started tearing down the altars of Baal and building the altar to Jehovah. That brings us to today's sermon called Pass the Test. Gideon is now poised for victory. He's ready to go. He's on fire. But before God can entrust him with victory, he has to pass the test. There's a refining work for Gideon and for all of us. Now to help us learn the truth for today, we printed our world famous sermon notes. They're like, like this, you can take them out now and follow along with me as we discover more about life transformation. There at the top of your notes and on your screen is our scripture text for today, taken from Judges 6, 33 to 35. Now receive the word of the Lord. Soon afterward, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning their warriors, and all of them responded. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. So Gideon has captured God's vision. He's on the move. He's aligning with God's purposes. And the first thing he does is to begin to gather an army because this is what seemed logical and reasonable to him. But the problem is he's trying to achieve divine destiny in human strength. 
You can't follow God with human wisdom. You can't rely on your own ability, your own talent, your own power to get God's will done. So God begins to refine him. And in his story today, we can learn the three tests you must pass for your turnaround. And here's the first test, the test of convictions. The first test for Gideon and our first test is the test of convictions because convictions are the foundational principles upon which you base your decisions. God tested Gideon and exposed his foundation and we discover his foundation is wrong. Like most of us, Gideon started out using his own reasoning. He thought, if I'm going against this huge army, I need more men. More power will match power with power. But here's the problem. You can't do God's work in your own strength. In Judges 6.35, we saw already Gideon blew a ram's horn as a call to arms. He called the men. They came from Ebiezer, Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. He summoned them, and they responded. But outward appearances are are deceiving. Gideon didn't need a crowd of men. He needed committed men. So listen to what God says in Judges 7 2. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. And that's the lesson we all need to learn. If you want a breakthrough and you think it will come by your own reasoning and plotting and planning and effort, then when God gives you a breakthrough, you'll be strutting down Lagos Avenue with swag. I'm the man. Look at me. I did it. And God will not get the glory. But when you depend upon him and follow him, no matter what it looks like, then you will give God praise and everyone will clap for the Lord because of your testimony. You see, our own reasoning and our own ability will fail us. That's why Proverbs 14 says, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, pata pata, but the tent of the godly will flourish. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Turn your notes over to page two and consider that you may think the best way to get your turnaround is to use your own wisdom, but the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. Man's ways lead to destruction. That's why Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. That's the lesson we can learn from my good friend Mark Beacom, from the United States. I've known Mark for over 40 years, and many years ago, he faced a crisis in his life. He needed work, he needed a job. He had a wife and children, but he was out of work, so he started searching for a job, and eventually he got two offers. The first job offer was from a big, successful company, and the pay and benefits were very attractive. It looked enticing. The second offer was from a smaller company that didn't look so good and wasn't seemingly as beneficial. Well, it seemed obvious you take the first offer, right? But Mark is a man who listens to Jesus and follows him. So before he made a decision, he prayed. He asked his pastor to pray. And when they prayed, God spoke clearly, reject offer number one, take offer number two. People thought Mark was crazy. Are you mad? But he obeyed God and took the second offer. Shortly afterwards, the first big successful company with the huge offer of benefits, that company went bankrupt. Everybody lost their job. And God blessed Mark Beacom in the second place, and he became very successful because the ways of the Lord are always right. When you follow him, you're guaranteed blessing. That's why Isaiah 58, 11 says, the Lord will guide you continually. Tell your neighbor continually giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. So here's your final exam question on your first test. Are you going through life based on assumptions or are you dedicated to follow Jesus Christ? For after all, your entire Christian life, everything about your path with God comes down to one command, one simple word, one thing you must do, one conviction you must hold to. It's the word follow. In Matthew 9, 9, Jesus said, follow me. He said to Peter, follow me. He said to the disciples, follow me. He said to the rich young ruler, follow me. To every man in every nation, in every 
generation to us today, Jesus has one simple command. Every other command is summed up in this one word, follow. Because when you follow Jesus, you live like Jesus, you look like Jesus, you love like Jesus, you act like Jesus. And all of us are called to walk on different paths in different areas. But we're all called to follow Jesus. You may be called to be a business tycoon. Be a business tycoon who looks like Jesus. You may be called to be a politician. Be a politician who looks like Jesus. You may be called to be a teacher or an educator or a scientist. Whatever you do, do what you do and look like Jesus because all of our life comes down to following him. So let me ask you a question today. Is following Jesus a conviction or an option? Are you following Jesus when it's convenient and you make other choices when you don't understand? Or are you determined to follow Jesus no matter what it looks like, no matter what anybody says, no matter what else comes your way? This is Gideon's test, and it's our test. And by God's grace, many of us believe we're following Jesus. Many of us think, "Ah, after all, I'm, I'm here in church, I'm following Jesus. I'm praying, I'm following Jesus. I'm reading my Bible, I'm following Jesus. I give my offering, I'm following Jesus. But here's the truth we need to remember. You can't follow Jesus if you don't listen to Jesus. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. And listening precedes following. To follow Jesus, you have to communicate with Jesus. That's the lesson we can learn from my friend, uh, Kojo. One day, Kojo was in his flat, and he noticed that his couch was looking really rough and ragged. So Kojo decided that he wanted to reupholster the couch and freshen it up. He decided to take it to someone down the road who did that type of work, and he decided to put it in his truck and carry the couch down there. But Kojo, being a macho Ghanaian man, decided he could do it by himself, amen? So he got behind the couch, and he pushed and pushed and pushed, And he got it to the door. But when Kojo got the couch to the door, the couch got stuck in the door. He was pushing and pulling and twisting and turning. It wouldn't move. So Kojo quickly calls his friend Fred, who lives nearby, and said, Fred, get over here. I need your help. And Fred showed up and saw the problem. He said, don't worry. I'll help you move it. So Fred was on the outside on one end of the couch, and Kojo was on the inside on the other end of the couch, and they started pushing. They were pushing and pulling twisting and turning, lifting and grunting and groaning. They were sweating. After 20 minutes, the couch had not moved at all. Hey! They fell down exhausted. They were sweating. And Kodro said, I don't think this couch is ever going to move. We'll never get it out. Out, Fred said. Out? I thought we were moving it in. Hey! Hey, A failure to communicate had caused the two men to work against each other. And that's how it is with us. Failure to communicate sometimes means God is pushing you in one direction and you're working against God. You're not listening to him. And you can't move in the same direction when you don't listen. Your turnaround in 2024 will take place when you listen to Jesus and do what he says. So in order to pass the test, you need to do these two things. First, keep in constant communication with God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, never stop praying. All through the day, keep your spirit open to the Lord. Some of you are on the text all day long. Do the same with your spirit and pray to God because when you do that, then you'll do the second thing, keep in step with God. Galatians 5, 25 says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. When you keep in step with the spirit, every decision, every every choice, every option, every opportunity, you listen to him and obey him. So here's how to pass the first test. Lift your hand and say after me, I am dedicated to follow Jesus. 
And that brings us to our second test today, the test of commitment. Listen to how our story continues in Judges 7-3. The Lord said to Gideon, therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. So Gideon has heard from God. He's following God. He's left his assumption as he's doing the right thing. God says, you've got too many men. So now now he gives Gideon the second test, the test of commitment. God said, you've got too many, so he begins to winnow them out. And he looked for men who were timid or lukewarm or afraid, and he said, they can go home. And here's God's word to all of us. God is not looking for people who put in an appearance. God is looking for people who have a heart after him. God is not looking for spectators. He's looking for participants who go all in with all their heart, devoted to him to pursue his presence and passion. We don't know why the 22,000 showed up. Maybe they were looking for some free meals and a parade of honor. We don't know if they felt ashamed to stay home when their neighbors were going. But no matter what, they appeared, but their heart was not in it. And today God says, don't just put in an appearance, for appearances are deceiving. Unfortunately, we live in a world today that centers around appearance. This is the danger of social media. It's great and can be used for the gospel, but too much on social media is an illusion and a mirage. Everybody works hard to give a good appearance on Facebook and on social media, but those things are deceiving because everybody's life looks better on Facebook. Everybody's image is better on Facebook. They're having more fun and have more friends, but appearances, are deceiving. Take this guy, for example. He's my favorite guy on Facebook. Charlie. Hey, Charlie. This is Facebook post. Charlie at the beach. He's chilling. Pass me another beer. But the reality is this. Hey, Charlie. He's not at the beach. He's not chilling. He's on a pile of sand in the Zongo. Everybody say, hey, Charlie. Appearances are deceiving. That's the problem with some of you young men. You're easily distracted by appearances. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. <laughs> A young lady comes and bats her eyelashes at you. Your heart starts beating. Your hands start shaking. She's batting her eyelashes. Bruh, those things aren't real. <laughs> They're fake. She bought them at Melcom. Melcom! <laughs> Two Ghana 90. Hey! Appearances are deceiving. And if the eyelashes are fake, what else is fake? I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen to your father. Listen to me today. Tiawo <laughs> Eja. Let me give you some advice. When you board a trotro, and a beautiful lady smiles at you, and she flashes her Melcom eyebrows at you. <laughs> Do not smile back until after she has paid her trotro fare. <laughs> ladies, 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 you're not left out. Ladies, listen up. A lot of men will show up, but they need to grow up, because if you don't put up, they'll give up. So don't trip up, wake up. When a man turns up, ask yourself, what's up? Because if all he wants is breast, thigh, and leg, send him to KFC. <laughs> you're not a value meal. You're a daughter of destiny. So don't marry a man based on what he drives. Marry a man based on what drives him. Thank you very much. Because appearances are deceiving. And the same thing is true in the house of God. Listen to what God says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Men focus on appearance, but God is searching the heart. That's what happened to these 30,000 men. 22,000 had an appearance, but they didn't have a heart. And God said, send them home. They came, but they were not committed. They put in an appearance, but they didn't put in their hearts. 
And these same people are still with us in the church today. They sing the songs, but they don't stay the course. They pray the prayers, but they don't practice what they preach. And Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, these people honor me with their lips. Ufata, ufata, ufata. But their hearts are far from me. Wujime, wujime, wujime. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man made ideas as commands from God. Turn your notes over to page three. God is not simply looking for people who put in an appearance. He's looking for people who are passionately seeking his presence. He's looking for people like King David who wrote in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever because worship requires passion. Worship requires participation. Church is not entertainment. This is not a, a, a place of a music concert. It's an encounter with God. So here's your final exam question for test number two. Are you just putting in an appearance? Or are you passionately pursuing God's presence and purposes? For Paul lays out the example to us of how to pass the test. He wrote in Philippians 3, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And you can pass this test. Lift your hand and say, I'm driven to pursue Jesus. And that brings us to our third test, the test of character. Listen to the third test in Gideon 7, 4 to 8. We read these words. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. 10,000 is too much, oh Bring them down to the spring, and I will test. Everybody say test. I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who lift the water in their hand, cup it in their hand, and lap it with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put all those who kneel down with their face in the stream and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands. 9,700 put down their sword, dipped their head in the water, and weren't looking for the enemy. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. <sighs> So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept the 300 men with him. So here's the final test for Gideon and for us. It's a test of character. See, the remaining men had passed the first test. They were listening to God, not depending on their own reasoning. They were following him. And they passed the second test. They were committed. When the timid and the shy went home, they remained. But they got diverted at the end because they looked from their destiny to their appetite. When given the chance to remain vigilant, even when it wasn't necessary, they let go of their vigilance and chose to satisfy an immediate appetite. You see, with their face in the stream, they weren't watching for the enemy. With their face in the stream, they were unprepared to fight. But if you took the water and held it in your hand, you were looking for the enemy, you were ready to fight. And this small decision had a big implication. You see, at first we think, well, what was the big deal? Come on, God, they made a small mistake. It doesn't mean anything. But small decisions can be indicative of big problems. If you will drop your guard when you think no one is watching, you're unfit for the battle. If you will drop your character when you think it doesn't matter, you're unfit for the destiny God has determined for you. If they would take their eyes off the prize in this moment of weakness, how would they respond in the heat of the battle? And when they chose immediate gratification over their long-term story, God rejected them. But the truth is, you cannot give in to your appetites and still achieve your destiny. And these men are a warning to us. For small choices 
have big consequences. That's the lesson we can learn from the famous American pastor, Craig Rochelle. Craig Rochelle is the founder and senior pastor of The Life Church, one of the biggest churches in America. But before he was famous and a pastor, he was a young man who had to face those small decisions of appetite or diligence. One day when he was in university, he was preparing for an exam when his friends decided to throw a party. They invited him and tried to lure him and persuade him to come to the party. And he had a choice. Do I have temper? Temporary, immediate gratification, go to the party and have fun? Or do I commit myself to pursue my destiny and stay and study? And Craig Groeschel made a critical small decision that had big implications. He rejected the party and went to the library to study. And God blessed him. There at the library, he met a young lady who introduced him to her friend, a young lady named Amy. Craig and Amy got to know each other, eventually married, and they're married today for more than 30 years with six children and six grandchildren, pastoring one of the biggest churches in America. One small decision to deny his appetite led to a very big blessing. But the opposite is also true. Small decisions to yield to your appetite can have devastating consequences. You think it's, it's no big deal. It, it doesn't mean. It's just five minutes on, you know, I'm just watching pornography. It's okay, it's just once. It's just a little money. The boss won't know. He won't care. He doesn't miss the money. He has a house at the Jingano. It's just one little lie. And I need to cover up, otherwise I'll get in trouble. But small sin grows. Little appetites turn into raging desires. That's why James 1.15 says your desire grows inside you until it results in sin. Then the sin grows bigger and bigger and finally ends in death. A little sin grows and sin kills. A little bitterness grows and kills relationships. A little worry grows and kills peace. A little doubt grows and kills your self-esteem. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. Sin makes a promise that sin can't keep. When sin wins, you lose. Turn your notes over to page four and hear this truth from Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. So here's your final exam question for test number three. Are you easily distracted by your appetites or are you diligently developing Christ-like character? A lot of us have goals for this year. Financial goals, career goals, education goals, family goals. Do you have spiritual growth Goals, because when you're diligent to become like Jesus, when you're pursuing him, you won't turn aside for your appetites. That's why God speaks to us in 1 John 2, don't love this evil world or the things in it. If you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. This is all there is in the world, wanting to please our sinful selves, wanting the sinful things we see and being too proud of what we have. But none of these come from the Father. They come from the world. The world is passing away and all the things that people want in the world are passing away. But whoever does what God wants will live forever. So what priorities are you pursuing? Are you devoted to Christ? Are you devoted to him as you used to be? What are your priorities? Are you seeking the permanent or the pleasurable? Are you here to write a story that your children and grandchildren will recite with pride? Or are you here to fulfill an appetite that will lead to destruction? For you see, in the moment of decision, we see options, not stories. Stories are long-term future tense. Stories are what the grandchildren will tell about you in generations to come, but options are immediate, an option for gratification, for pleasure, for a benefit. But when we choose the immediate gratification over our long-term stories, we end up losing both. In order to have a turnaround, you have to pursue the right priorities. Don't live for the passing pleasures. Pass the test. Lift your hand and say, I'm determined to become like Jesus. I choose the permanent over the pleasurable. So here's what God wants from all of us today. He wants us to pass the test. But in order to pass the test, you have to answer the questions. In order to pass the test, you have to sit for the examination. That's what God is calling us to do. 
before we experience an external turnaround, we must have an internal turnaround. We have to sit for the examination and pass the test. That's why God says to us today in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you failed the test of genuine faith. So let's do that. Let's turn our sanctuary into an examination hall. As we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, let's examine ourselves. Ask yourself these questions. Am I going through life based on assumptions, what looks good, or am I dedicated to following Jesus Christ? Am I just putting in an appearance, or am I passionately pursuing God's presence and his purposes? Am I easily distracted by my appetites, or am I diligently developing Christ-like character? Because I don't know about you, but I came to follow Jesus. See, I'm not perfect, but I'm pursuing perfection. And I'm not always right, but I'm aiming to go right. I'm determined to become like Jesus. I will keep my hand on the plow and my eyes on the prize. I will stay alert and stay awake and stay close to Jesus, for I'm dedicated to follow Jesus. I won't make assumptions on what looks good or what's convenient. I won't make decisions based on what others say. I will listen to God and follow him, for I'm devoted to pursuing him. I'm not here to put in an appearance. I came to meet with Jesus. I'm passionate about about his presence and his purposes. And I am determined to be like Jesus. I won't let up. I won't fall asleep. My appetites will not rule over me. I won't pursue pleasure. I'm aiming for a story that gives God glory. And by his grace, I will pass the test. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we need you, Lord. Open our eyes today. Show us the truth. Show us the level of our convictions, commitment, character, as you see them. Father, we pray you'll forgive us. We're so easily distracted by appetites. We're so often apathetic, putting in an appearance just to show up, but not to be committed. We so often base our decisions on what we think will work out well. Help us, Lord. Let us hear from you. Let us follow you. Let us be like you. As we receive your body and blood, come and meet with us. Examine us. Pinpoint those areas of our lives where we are giving the wrong answer so that we might be changed and pass the test. In Jesus' name.